In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Conscious being in the presence of our Lord, we should say together first, O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. I welcome you all once again, pilgrims who've come today, and we have pilgrims from Greenwich that have joined us during the day, and also uh, pilgrims who are on retreat at the Divine Retreat Center across the road. Welcome to you all. I'm always conscious, being in the presence of the Holy Eucharist, that it was the same Holy Eucharist that gave St. Augustine strength for his journey. It gave him his viaticum. And it always strikes me when we have Mass here at the shrine of St. Augustine that the first Masses for the English people were probably celebrated very near to here on the coast because we know from the writings of the Venerable Bede in his ecclesiastical history that when the monks first landed here in the year 597, they had to wait several days before the king came to visit them, King Ethelbert, who was the leading king of the Anglo-Saxons at the time. So without doubt, they would have celebrated the sacraments here for the first time for the English people. And it's wonderful that we're part of that same tradition today. St. Augustine came from a distant land, probably, the scholars say, Sicily, although he was living in Rome in the monasteries of Pope Gregory the Great. But he came to this land and he helped it to become what it was meant to be, a truly Christian country. And that's what this shrine is about. The story of St. Augustine is a wonderful story, and it begins in Rome, in the heart and mind of another saint, St. Gregory the Great. Gregory the Great was one of the most wonderful popes of the early Middle Ages. You see, at the end of the sixth century, the Roman Empire had collapsed and the whole of Europe was in disarray. Pope Gregory the Great did the most remarkable thing. He began missions out to the furthest corners of the old empire, including to Britannia, this land. He was a Benedictine monk and a great scholar. And he constructed on his ancestral home uh, a monastery. And as a monk, one day, walking through the market squares of Rome, slavery had come back, sadly. He noticed that there were some slaves who had fair hair. And he said, who are these? Because you know the Italians tend to be dark in complexion. And he said, who are these? And his attendant said to him, they're angles. They're angles. He said, not angles, angels. Non angli said Angeli. That's what he said in Latin. And from that moment, it seems that he conceived a mission to the Angles. And when he was elected Pope, because he was such a brilliant man from a great senatorial family, they believed that he could bring stability to Rome. He'd been a great emissary for a previous Pope. And when he was elected Pope, People thought maybe he would just consolidate the treasures of the church to hold on in this stormy period of barbarianism, what we call the beginning of the Dark Ages. But he did the opposite. He went out on mission. Not himself, because he was not allowed, but by means of missionary monks from his own monastery of St. Andrew in Rome. You can still visit the site where they were sent from, on the Chalian Hill. It's near the Colosseum. If some of you have been to Rome, you can visit it. From the Chalian Hill in Rome, Gregory the Great sent his prior, St. Augustine, and 40 monks. And they set out, but by the time they got to about Marseille, in southern Gaul, modern-day France, they started to get worried. They were hearing stories that these people, these Angles, the, were dangerous barbarians, and that they would be killed upon arrival. 
St. Augustine goes back. There must have been a kind of rebellion, I think, reading between the lines amongst the 40 monks. So Augustine goes back to Gregory. And what does Gregory the Great say? Fine, come back. It's not worth risking your lives. No, he doesn't say that. He says a mission once begun must not be given up. This is of God. And Augustine, strengthened by the words of Gregory, we're told, went on. This isn't legend. This is history. We still have letters from Gregory the Great that have survived to some of the leading uh, kings in the regions through which Augustine and his 40 monks traveled. Gregory the Great prepared the way for Augustine's mission. In the spring of 597, they arrived probably near to where Boulogne is today. Some of you must have visited Boulogne in northern France. And they set sail. I wonder if it was stormy or not. Sometimes spring in this country can be rather precarious. It was threatening to rain even today. Thankfully, it hasn't. But Augustine landed, and he landed on this island. You might think, an island? Yes, this was an island, and still is. There's a tiny river that still exists, the Wampsum River. In Augustine's time, it was a very big river, a very wide river. It was hard to cross. He landed on an island, scholars suggest, because it wouldn't seem threatening to the local king, Ethelbert, who lived in Canterbury. You think of 40 monks landing on it with a boat, with attendants and translators. It would have looked like an invasion party. But they only brought the, the, the message of the gospel. And so they landed on the island to be uh, unthreatening, and they waited. Eventually, King Ethelbert came to visit them. Ethelbert had somehow become open to Christianity, possibly because of new trade routes that this would open up to Gaul, which had become Christian, and to other lands. Or maybe it was because of his Frankish wife, Queen Bertha, who we don't hear much about, but must have worked for Christianity behind the scenes. Seemingly, she had married Ethelbert, but was not allowed to proclaim her faith. She could live it only privately. She may have been the great heroine behind the scenes. Augustine landed and preached to King Ethelbert. We're told that Ethelbert was superstitious, and he asked that he could sit under a great oak tree. The Anglo-Saxons had superstitions about trees. The god Woden was a god of the woods. If you remember the story of St. Boniface when he goes to Germany, he cuts down the tree to, to, to end paganism in Germany. Ethelbert preaches, uh, uh, Augustine preaches to Ethelbert, but Ethelbert sits under a tree because he feels there he will be safe from the magic that this missionary may work. He feared magic from Augustine. But all he heard from Augustine were words about good news, eternal life, God sending his son into the world. It's a message that's familiar, isn't it? It's the good news. It's the message that will never end, the message that will never change. Ethelbert didn't convert at first, I think because he had his own noble leaders around him, and to show weakness may have undermined his very kingship. But he did a remarkable thing, and very remarkable for those times. He invited the 40 monks to come back with him to his capital, Canterbury. He gave them freedom to practice their religion. He even gave them a little place to worship and live, and he gave them freedom to preach. In Count Canterbury, after several months of having watched these monks and their holy lives, their apostolic preaching, and indeed we're told by the Venerable Bede miracles that were worked by Augustine, Ethelbert asked himself to be baptized. And we're told by the Christmas of 597, he was baptized and so were many of his people. 3,000 in the rivers, we're told, around Canterbury. This was the beginning, just the beginning, of the conversion of the English people. The Irish from the north and this mission of Augustine from the south would lead to the conversion of the whole nation, within a hundred years. This place 
where you're set today is the shrine of the conversion of the English. It's the shrine that commemorates the landing of Augustine, the beginning of the gospel in this land. And, and he is still a powerful intercessor for us today. He only lived here for seven years. He died in 604 AD. But people knew that he was holy and that from heaven he would continue to pray for us. Soon a shrine was made for him in Canterbury, and th for a thousand years people visited that shrine. Indeed, at times in the Middle Ages, it was one of the most popular shrines in Europe, and there are whole accounts of miracles that were worked from the shrine of St. Augustine and around his holy relics. As you know, a tragic thing happened in this land 500 years ago. The Reformation led to a great and terrible change and cultural damage. Not only were the monasteries of this land, some 300 of them destroyed, but also all of the shrines of the saints of old, and England had so many of them. Augustine's shrine would never survive because what Augustine stood for was union with Rome, and you know Henry VIII wanted to cut that tie with Rome, with the Pope, with Gregory, with Peter. A sad time, and for three centuries the, the uh, tradition of St. Augustine was only kept alive by Catholics in hidden places and abroad. We call them recusants. I have books from the time of the martyrs, the Catholic martyrs of England, that still recall St. Augustine and the story that I've just told you. It looked as if the great tradition of England's conversion would never be celebrated again. And then in the 19th century, a remarkable thing happened. We call it a second spring. If the first spring is the coming of St. Augustine, the second spring is the time of Newman and the Oxford movement where people began to realize that England had a great tradition of sanctity. The saints returned and devotion to them, and not only within the Catholic Church, but in, within the established Church of England as well. People began to honor the saints once more, and just outside of Ramsgate, maybe you'll visit it one day, there is a cross that marks the place where Augustine is said to have actually preached to King Ethelbert, and that was constructed by Lord Granville, who was not a Catholic. Something changed in the 19th century. And on the anniversary of St. Augustine's landing in 1897, which is the 1400th anniversary of the landing of Augustine, all of the bishops of England and Wales came here. And thousands and thousands of people gathered. And the Pope himself sent a message in honor of the great festival, Pope Leo XIII. There was a second spring, and part of that second spring was the conversion of a certain man called Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin, who is buried in the little chapel to my left. Pugin was converted by architecture, seeing the beauty of churches like this from the medieval times, scattered around our country, in every town, in every city gems of architectural magnificence that pointed to the Catholic faith. And he became a Catholic convert, like Newman himself, like blessed John Henry Newman. Pugin would preach with his architecture as Newman would preach with his pen. And Pugin affected the Victorian age with the beauty of his ecclesiastical architecture. This is his model church because this was his personal church that he built. Today, once again, it's under restoration. Pugin moved here and lived here in Ramsgate because Augustine had landed. He wanted this place to stand as an inspiration, not only for architecture, but for a revival of Catholic faith. So this place stands for a first spring, the coming of Augustine. It stands for a second spring with Augustus Welby Pugin. But what about a third spring? That's us. That's you and me. In 2012, the Archbishop of Southwark, Peter Smith, came here and established this as the new shrine of St. Augustine. 
filling a gap of some 500 years since the destruction of the earlier shrine of Augustine in Canterbury. One small relic had survived from that time that had been kept abroad and had not been destroyed. That relic was brought here, and it is the only relic of St. Augustine in public veneration today. Relics are a physical reminder of the saint who intercedes for us. And Augustine is depicted in the beautiful statue carved by Pugin. Augustine is holding this church in his hands, and he's blessing us. Pilgrims now come. Last year, 10,000 pilgrims came to this church. And not only people of deep Catholic faith, but people who are interested in culture, in history, and they too are touched by this place. The beauty of holiness and the holiness of beauty. Augustine arrived here with a new song. This is the home of music, Gregorian chant. He arrived here and helped Ethelbert to construct Christian laws. This is the initiation of a Christian country, the beginning of Christian monarchy. He arrived here with an icon of Christ and a book of the Gospels. This is the beginning of Christian literature and art. And Pugin knew this and wanted this too to be a place of the revival of Christian arts, of beauty, so that people would be inspired to follow the gospel just as he had been inspired to receive the faith because of architecture. The third spring. The third spring is about us. Evangelization is not just about what happened long ago in the 6th century AD, however wonderful that is. It's not just about that brilliant period that we call the second spring in the 19th century. It's about now. I believe firmly that we can have a new evangelization, a re-evangelization of our country. All other things are shadows and dust. They're passing. We've just had a political election. All ideologies will come and go, but the gospel will remain. The gospel that Augustine preached to Ethelbert, the gospel that inspired the mind and heart of Pugin, that will remain. And while things may seem bleak for Christians at the moment, we just have to hold on and keep the faith. If we all live with the same zeal as St. Augustine and the same Catholic imagination of Pugin, I think we can effect a new evangelization. Pugin influenced the world. He's one man. Forty monks with St. Augustine converted this country. What can we do? What can we do, each in our parishes, in this place, today? O oh God, who by the preaching and miracles of blessed Augustine, thy confessor and bishop, did vouchsafe to enlighten the English nation by the shining of the true faith, grant that through his intercession the hearts of those who have gone astray may come back to the oneness of truth, and that our hearts may be united in doing thy will. Amen. Amen. Saint Augustine. Saint Gregory the Great. Blessed John Henry Newman. Before we continue with our prayers and benediction, I want to encourage you to become friends of this shrine. And you can become a friend of St. Augustine's and be kept in touch with all the events that happen here as this shrine develops. And I want to invite you personally, at the end of this month, we have our festival week, the week of St. Augustine. And there are leaflets as you go out with events throughout the week, uh, lectures, walks, prayers, masses, devotions. But the special day is on the 25th of May, which is our national pilgrimage when the relic of St. Augustine is processed along the shore where he landed from this church, and there is Mass here at 12 noon, the procession at 11. So please do come back for that day. It's a bank holiday, so many people I know will be free. And as you leave today, do have a look at the things that we have connected to the shrine, our prayer book, and a CD which has just been produced and is being offered today for the first time with Gregorian chant. This is where Gregorian chant began, fresh from the monasteries of Gregory the Great. And our wonderful Victoria Consort have recorded this CD with the music, with the, the chant that we believe Augustine was singing with his 40 monks as he arrived. 
Bede records that he was singing a particular psalm, and that's what the CD starts with, followed by a mass of St. Augustine. So do have a look at that, along with the Holy Chaplet of St. Augustine that's available. I thank you for coming today, and I, I, I pray that uh, your journey home may be uh, fruitful and you can bring all the graces that you've received here back to your parishes, your families, and your own lives. Amen. Ave Maria. Amen.